I think the other thing that I work with my children on is to be able to do Catholic things without embarrassment. So bless yourselves at different times, pray before meals, no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. Um, Those are more like outwardly prayerful things. Yeah. But I think sometimes kids get embarrassed to do them when no one else is. This episode of Beyond Sunday is brought to you by Assumption University in Windsor, Ontario, one of Canada's most historic Catholic institutes of higher learning, tracing its origins to 1857. Learn more about their online graduate diploma in Catholic studies by going to assumptionu.ca or follow them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Welcome to Beyond Sunday, a podcast for parents like us striving to weave the Sunday experience into the everyday moments of our week. I'm your co-host, Nicole Joyce. And I'm Rocky McCormick, your other co-host. Grab yourself a cup of something warm, maybe snag some cider and donuts, and join us as we talk, laugh, and reflect on our experiences raising Catholic families and allowing God to transform our everyday lives. All right, Nicole, inquiring minds want to know, do you like pumpkin spice anything? Hmm. I'm going to go with yes. Oh, okay. But I mean, I like the spices Mm. that go in things like pumpkin pie and pumpkin muffins. Okay. I don't generally drink the latte, though. Okay. Yeah. Because it's like pumpkin spice season. Yes. I am a caramel apple cider gal. I do love that, yes. Not so much. Like, everything is pumpkin spice, though. Like, I feel like at some point they're going to have pumpkin spice deodorant, and I'm just not here for that. I mean, I feel like I wouldn't mind smelling a little cinnamon-y. Cinnamon. Cinnamon. <laughs> is that like Nemo trying to say anemone? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> I will it say is. I was downstairs in the commuter lounge earlier and the loveliest sister, I think she was a Dominican, came in with donuts from the cider mill and it was so sweet. Oh, Literally and figuratively. The cider yeah. Mill. Okay. yeah. So I just, I think it's overdone. I think we've, I think we've done it to death. Mm-hmm. We made it a little too extra. L- beyond. Beyond extra. Beyond extra. Okay. Anyway, okay. I was just curious now that we're well into October, whether your house is full of pumpkin spice and other things nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. All right. So what are we talking talk about this week? Well, so I was reading the gospel and it's God versus Caesar. So we're not going to talk about Caesar, though. Oh, render unto Caesar what is Caesar. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. It's not okay. God versus, but like give to God what is God, give to the the state what is the state. Mm-hmm. Um, but that got me to think about... Um, John Paul II, because also on Sunday, we celebrate the feast day of St. John Paul II. Well, is it a feast? Is it a solemnity? It's nothing because it's on a Sunday, but... It, yeah, it's just a Sunday. Yeah. But anyway, mm-hmm. his feast day is Sunday. Okay. And it's also my daughter's 13th birthday, Lord help us, mm-hmm. official teenager. Um, but it made me think of my first encounter with John Paul II before he was ever a saint. I think he was definitely Pope because he was Pope for a really long time. Um But I was doing a research paper in college. I studied political science, and so I was doing research in one of those classes about the downfall of the Eastern Bloc and of communism in Eastern Europe, and his name kept coming up over and over, although at at that point I think he was um, probably going to butcher the Polish Karl Wojtyla. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So, and I was nowhere near Catholic at the time, right? Like, not even on my radar. So after my conversion, I made the connection of the two, and so... I just thought it was super cool that my first encounter with this great saint was not even from anything that was super Catholic, but was from a very secular political study. Mm -hmm. He was working on you undercover. He was, (laughs) much like the Eastern Bloc. See how I did that? Yeah, Mm -hmm. very nice. Mm -hmm. Well played. Well played. So I'll say then, after coming into the church, one of his beautiful legacies, at least one that, that really moves me, is his commitment to youth, especially in establishing World Youth Day. Um... And really encouraging our young people to claim the gifts that they have now. You know, I think a lot of times we hear that the youth are the future of the church. And he was really a champion of saying, no, our young people are part of the church now. Mm -hmm. Right. They have gifts to share now. And we're going to help them grow into the gifts that they will have as adults, into the fullness of those gifts. But we have to start calling them forth now. Um, And so... That was one. And then also the value of redemptive suffering was a beautiful theology that, that I really, really moved me Yeah, when I was studying early, early in my, in my Catholic years. I do feel like we've talked about suffering enough on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> 
So maybe we won't focus in on the redemptive suffering for this one, but focusing in on maybe how do we teach our children to be witnesses for the gospel right where they are with the gifts of their age, whatever that might be, not in spite of it. Okay. I like it. Yeah? Yeah. You look tentative. So first, let me say, I love John Paul II. He's like in my top 10 for sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe my top five. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, for totally different reasons, actually, because I really came to love him as a result of Theology of the Body. Fair. But before that, um, he wrote a book while he was cardinal called mm-hmm. Love and Responsibility yeah. that I think really was groundbreaking in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. in particular in how we think about what it means to be a human person in relationship and how we understand the varying levels of relationship between us as, as people. Um, and so I appreciate all of what he does, but I think when I think of him, obviously, yes, we think of the youth. Mm-hmm. We think of theology of the body and love and responsibility. But then we also, um, I just want to give this shout out to, we also think about how how much he was an encourager of the new evangelization. Absolutely. And so how those three things come together in my mind has yeah. everything to do with how we help our young people uncover and understand and recognize their own dignity mm-hmm. and how they live that forth by being evangelizers in this age. Absolutely. And I think too, like as a creative and as a woman, his letters to cre- letter to artists and his letter to women, letter, letter to women, yeah. um, both really, really draw into the heart of all of that as well. Yes. So, well, since this is a podcast of the Archdiocese of Detroit, It seems only appropriate that we would talk about evangelization through this lens of what we call the Detroit model of evangelization. And um, I I think what's interesting when we talk about evangelization, if anyone who's ever like done any reading up on this topic knows that every church, every denomination Mm -hmm. has some model or icon or diagram of what that looks like. And it's always a big circle. It's always like a wheel with like different stops, right? Mm. Like it always Never has a flow like chart. N- eh, well, it, maybe, but then there's an arrow that goes from the bottom of the flow chart back, back to, to the, the top. top. Yeah, right, right. right. It's always cyclical. So um, the, these four kind of like points mm-hmm. inside this this cycle, if you will, could really be called lots of different things. Mm-hmm. But in Detroit, we've given them specific names. And so, if any of you are really big followers of the Unleash the Gospel movement. You've probably heard these before. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, I definitely have seen some stuff with those words on it before. I have to say, every time we, we talk about Unleash the Gospel, I always want to make like a roaring sound. Mm, kind of like unleashing the Kraken, but not. Yeah. Yeah. See, I always want to like play like a tambourine when I hear <laughs> Joyful Band of Missionary oh, Disciples. Yes. Kind of like Robin Hood and his merry yes, men. Yes, like we <laughs> should like leap through the air with a tambourine or something. Yes, I'm Well, we are band. supposed to praise him with the harp and... Amen. And, in drums, right? Yes, yeah, amen. absolutely. Yes. All right, so what is this model of evangelization? Where do we start? So we start with a tract. Like, what is it that makes someone want to come and be part of your community? Or what is it sure. about you yeah. that draws people to you that they find interesting? What makes someone want to know more mm-hmm. or participate in some way in anything that you're doing? Yeah. And as church, that means like, does our church look nice? Are Do, people friendly? Are people friendly? <laughs> right. Is our website easy to maneuver? Like, can I find when mass is on mm-hmm. your website? Can sure. I find out what kind of people go there? Are the pictures nice? Does it look like a nice place I'd want to sit? Yeah, but it almost reminds me, I mean, scripturally of, of St. Peter when he's talking about, you know, live in such a way that people want to ask why you live the way that you live. Yeah. Right. So yeah. so are our websites welcoming? Are our people friendly? I mean, like, are we talking about all the families of parishes across the Archdiocese of Detroit? Cause I'm I just think, thinking my own family. There, there are days go. when we aren't super friendly. There you go. <laughs> when we are a little surly. But, That's but not what, what we're But what does that mean about. for our kids, right? Like, how, how do our kids mm-hmm. attract other people to, to want to be part of the faith? Well, that, but I think we have to begin before that. How do we attract our kids? Mm. Right? Like, I think first we have to attract them and then teach them how to attract. Sure. Right? So what is it that makes them feel seen as they are? Because I think that's the first step. Right yeah. is, is to be welcoming, not to the point where anything goes, but to the point where people feel comfortable and like they're accepted as human beings. Yeah. So I think uh, back to my husband's experience before he came into the church, mm-hmm. he was a, maybe like a an early teen and his parents were part of a large kind of mega church. Mm-hmm. Um, and he remembers walking up to like Wednesday night service and getting ready to walk through the door and having a guy outside in a suit stop him and say like stop right there you're not coming to the Lord's house dressed like that Mm. (laughs) and he was just like turned on one heel and was like I'm out right like that's and I think again like there's a healthy balance like of course we want 
to teach people how to give honor and to glorify God in that way. Right. But I think we have to be able to read the room. Is that really what we're doing here with what we're saying in this very specific moment? And do you have the relationship with the person to be able to say it? Yeah. Right? Like it sounds really different coming from a stranger than coming from your buddy who's like, dude, yeah. what are you wearing, man? Sure. Right? Sure. Right. And sometimes coming from mom and lots of eye rolls. <laughs> Let's be real. Um, but I do think that that's, that's the first thing, right? Like people want to feel wanted. Yeah. They want to feel seen. And I know not all of us are like super extroverted kind of people yeah and we're not saying that you have to say hi to every single person and be all up in everyone's business but just a warm smile sometimes Mm -hmm. and and making space for people in the pew even though it might involve our pew transporting one of your screaming toddlers off the floor so someone (laughs) can get into the pew we've all been there we we have we have Mm -hmm. um or maybe even it's letting go of your pew so that somebody can sit down (gasps) I know it's a novel concept that we don't own the pews, but my name might be. I know. Trust me, we have our we have our spot in the church, which I'm trying to change, and my family is like, no, <laughs> no. But I think in in the same vein, like we need to create joy around what we're doing. Nobody wants to come into something that seems somber and miserable. Yes, I mean, yes, redemptive suffering. Thank you, Saint John Paul II. However, people want to come in to something that is joyful and uplifting. Mm-hmm. Right. I remember when I was working in young adult ministry and I was speaking to a young lady who left the church. She used to go with her grandma and she left because what she would say is we would go. And I just every weekend would think, where is the joy? Like these people are bored. They're mumbling responses. And then they make a beeline and fight each other out of the parking lot. Hmm. Interesting. Where is the joy? If Jesus is who he says he is, if he is my Lord and my Savior, and he has done these marvelous things for us, yeah, why aren't they more joyful about yeah. it? Now, that opened the door for a better, a long conversation. Sure. But still, as a starting point, how many people are we turning off when we aren't joyful about our relationship with Jesus? Yeah. That kind of reminds me of, um, I think we've talked about this before, like, do we look like the kind of people others want to be around? Like, do, do these people look inviting? Do we look like the kind of people who I want to stay here and come back next week? And I always think back to this time, my daughter and I were having this conversation and I said something and it was like a kind of serious conversation. And and I was like, you know, I just need you to understand that you're you're not in trouble, but, but you know, I just want to make sure that you really grasped what, what we're talking about. And she was like, you keep saying I'm not in trouble but your face looks like I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> so like, you know, what what is your face saying when someone walks by you and you've never <laughs> seen them before or they want to sit in your pew, right? Like what what, what are you, what's your body language looking like here? Um and do we really appear to be warm and welcoming? And sometimes it takes a little bit of extra effort. And I think for kids, that's definitely going to take some practice. Um, to just try our best even. I never I never expect my kids to be like completely fake, right? I'm never going to ask them to do that. That's crazy. But I am <laughs> going to ask them to like put your best foot forward, mm-hmm. right? Like try to try to really dig deep and be grateful for, for the people who are here. And can you make yeah. sure that you express that to them? Yeah. I do want to throw in there though that, you know, we're not asking one people to be fake. And two, we're not asking everybody to be the same, right? Amen. Like you, you can be solemn and you can be, somber without being sorrowful and sour. Yes. And so I don't want to, people to mistake this to say, you know, I really take the mass reverently and sure. I am quiet when I am engaging in, in worship. That That's fine. But again, like you're saying, like, is your face welcoming? Do you look Do you gentle? Look like, you like being right. Here? Like, I don't know. There's like a gentleness about the spirit when mm-hmm. somebody is praying somberly, even without speaking, to say that this there is something here and that there is a spot for you here. And I think, though, even though we don't want our kids to be fake, and they won't, they won't be fake. It's hard. They don't. They speak their minds for the most part. But I think they're also really good at being welcoming. Like, very few people are going to say no to a little kid. Yeah. And so I think that if we are joyful with our families while we are there. Mm-hmm. And we can teach our kids to ask yes. questions, right? Like, I think mine just grew up asking questions. Like, they just were born asking questions. Mm-hmm. But you know, questions about the other people, right. right? Like, oh, where are you from? What 
where where do you go to school? How old are you? What's right. your favorite subject? Do you play soccer? Like these are things that kids naturally want to know about people anyway. Yeah. So encouraging that mm-hmm. instead of shushing them, I think is also very helpful. <laughs> Although maybe not during, not during the mass, actual mass. But yeah. you know, <laughs> right. before mass, after mass, right? Donut like, Sunday. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. So they're they're really good little socializers. Yes. And they are inquisitive. Yes. And don't be afraid to give them some praise and encouragement on the spot when you see them doing that mm-hmm. and being welcoming to people. Right. Yes. Um, right after we attract someone into wanting to even participate in anything we're doing, mm-hmm. um, we offer or we try to offer all throughout the year different opportunities for people to encounter mm. Christ in power. And I want to be very specific. Sometimes you'll hear us say things like attract, encounter, grow, witness. And you only hear the one word, right? Because those are easy things to remember. Right. But we're very specific here. Like we're talking about encountering Jesus Absolutely. in power in a wonderful, beautiful way, in a way that really fills you up and changes your life. And I've said it over and over again. If you've met Jesus Christ and he's changed your life forever, there is no right. way you can just not tell other people about it. So the encounter opportunities are times where we've really set the stage and made the environment one mm-hmm. that really lends itself mm-hmm. to people experiencing that. We can't make anybody encounter anybody, right? Right. Right. But we can set the stage for that. We can open the door for that. We can make an in- welcoming environment. And not to be spiritually manipulative, but to know how it is that people might open themselves yes. to allow Christ that opportunity. Because he's the one doing the work. The Holy Spirit yes. is the one doing the work. We're just setting the stage. Mm-hmm. right? And I think it's important, too, especially as we're, we're looking at our children, and we've talked about this before, to realize that there are so many different ways that the Lord might want to encounter us. And so looking at the natural affinities of our children, what is it that brings them joy when we are talking about the spiritual life? Because if they are there and they are joyful, then people are drawn to that. And in being drawn to that, then there's that opportunity for them to encounter Christ yeah, in a powerful way, in a life-altering, transformative way. Yeah. And obviously the, the number one opportunity for encounter that we that we offer every week yeah. is to come to mass sure. right but also any other opportunities we have for worship or participation in other liturgies mm-hmm. is another really beautiful way to bring people in and i want to make an, an important note here too about coming to something like um an opportunity for worship mm-hmm. so first i got to give a shout out because sunday october 22nd there will be an opportunity for worship at christ our light church in troy at six o'clock called Come Encounter Christ, and it's specifically for young people and their families to come and have an opportunity for adoration and powerful preaching and confession. This is a beautiful experience outside of Mass Yes, where people have an opportunity to really offer up their praise and worship in a different and unique way. Well, I think it's like a non-committal way to invite people. Exactly. Right? Like, so coming to Mass, I think all eyes are on you. Am I doing the right thing? Am I saying the right thing? This is just a beautiful experience to sit and to receive and to offer your worship. But I think for people who might be a little bit afraid of coming to Mass or coming to church, that this is a beautiful opportunity for them to just come receive the Lord. Yes. Both in the real presence, in the music, and if they wish to, to avail themselves of the Sacrament of Reconciliation. And it is designed, the preaching is designed to be for young people. Yes. And honestly, in young adult ministry, we always used to say, everybody wants to feel young. So for preaching to the young, we're really preaching to all of us because we're supposed to come as little children. So yeah. So the other part of that, I think, too, is that um, come and enc- come come encounter Christ. And if you've ever been to like awaken, yeah, for example, um, if you've ever been to um, a Steubenville conference mm-hmm. or the National Catholic Youth Conference, if you've ever been to something like that where there's a lot of really lively music and and really powerful preachers or speakers, you know that that's kind of like a specific kind of style, right? Yes. And I just want to make sure that we're not excluding people who have a different style of praise or worship. 100%. If you are the kind of person who is naturally drawn to silence, for example, mm-hmm. <laughs> you might not find this to be the place where no. you encounter the Lord in the same way that you might in a quiet chapel, right? right. So don't don't limit what you expose your family to or other people to or what you invite people to just because you think this is the only way that that will happen. Right. Well, and I think the other thing is to remember that this is a very particular experience and that there is a wide range of experiences that you'll have in the life of the church. Amen. I think while we're talking about the quiet and and the fact that there's going to be multiple different opportunities or experiences within the church, like I think these are sometimes high points and then people get disappointed that every mass isn't like that. Um, 
But again, I think of this as like you have a mountain tonic mountaintop experience and then that sustains you through kind of the valleys Mm -hmm. right but there are other ways then to encounter too the church has so many beautiful traditions and devotions designed specifically for us to have these intense encounters if we open our hearts to that and I think the beauty like in our family I think it's beautiful we kind of dabble in all of them to see what the kids respond to yes yes I think that's really important as parents like just because we might have one particular way that we prefer Mm -hmm doesn't mean that that's what our kids are going to be into. Yeah. So definitely making sure that we're diverse in what we take our family to and what we allow them to experience is really helpful. And then also in how we invite other people to come to those things too. Right. So there's adoration, there's rosaries, there's different novenas, which I am terrible at. Novenas. Mine usually end up being like a 15-day novena because mm-hmm. I forget and then I start and I forget and I start. Um, but also like different saints are going to draw different people and just even being able to invite people into that life of, of the mystical body of Christ in that way. Um, and our kids really love finding out all about these holy men and women. And so even allowing our children to take the lead sometimes. Sure. And to run with their feasting on those days. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, it's not just an internal thing, but anything that we do internally, once we encounter Christ, like you were saying, we want to, we want to tell the world, but we also want to show the world. Yeah. And I want to make sure before we get to that, I mm-hmm. do want to say that, um, part of that encounter absolutely has to do with encounter with other people, mm-hmm. <laughs> encountering right. Christ and others, yes, right? Like, yes, I think that's has. where you were going. It is absolutely yes, where okay. I was going. Yeah. hundred so okay. percent. Right. So like. Yes, we have that personal me and Jesus, but Mm -hmm. it's not just this vertical me and Jesus. It's also us and Jesus, right? That whole communal body. And so like the works of mercy are a beautiful way for us to show the world and to encounter Christ. I mean, that's how I came into the church, right? Like my very first encounter with Christ was at a soup kitchen and it was all like encountering encountering him in the least of these. Mm -hmm. And so especially with our young people who have hearts of service and justice, it's a beautiful opportunity for us to use those tools to be able to help them to see the face of Christ in the people that they are serving. And then after encounter, the Mm -hmm. next kind of point on this big circle has to do with growing, growing in our faith. Yeah, back to the model. (laughs) How are we growing in our faith? So like we we saw something that we liked about wanting to be part of this community or these people. We have encountered the Lord in whatever Mm -hmm. way, shape or form he came to us. And now we want to know more. Like now we really want to understand what is it what does it mean to live as a missionary disciple? Sure. Well, and I think there's two things here. One is the scriptures. You know, ignorance of scriptures is ignorance of Christ. And so making sure that our children are steeped in the word. Mm-hmm. And we can do that just fifty two Sundays has the Sunday readings in it. If we just do that. Fifty two Sundays is a great opportunity because it's it's so experiential. Mm-hmm. It's not just the word, but it's also like the conversation that happens afterwards. Right. And, you know, the activities and the time that you're spending together mm-hmm. as a family. Yep. And then I like to help my children find verses that are kind of their verses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that they, so they feel kind of a personal connection to those specific verses for comfort. Definitely for comfort, but also for conviction, right? I think like sometimes we can focus too much on the comfort and forget that we're also supposed to be convicted and and growing. And this kind of gets to the next thing is, is the charismatic catechesis. I know that was a really big word. Yeah, it's a really big word. Let's go back for a second. What do we mean by charisma? Be gospel centered, right? Like, there you go. Gospel centered. Why? Why Jesus? Mm-hmm. And making sure that we're Christ centered. Maybe we'll just say that. Let's let's bring it to Christ centered to know that what we're learning isn't just for the knowledge, but that it is supposed to have a specific impact in our lives and in the world. Yeah. So we can get in our heads and know everything there is to know about God. Mm-hmm. But do we know God? Do yeah. we know Jesus? Yeah. And, and I do think, we know His saving grace? Yeah. And I think it goes without saying that you know when you look at this this image of the circle with these arrows Mm -hmm. on it it's not like you just get on the bus and then you get get off on one (laughs) stop and then you get back on and go to the next stop right you're always living in all of these at the same time so there's a people mover if you will since yeah there you go so (laughs) so you always have the opportunity to continually grow and 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 renew your experiences and encounter it's a lifelong process yes exactly exactly it's a lifelong process Mm -hmm. but Again, especially with our kids, I think we have to help them make it make sense. Yeah. Especially when the world is so contrary to the things that we are teaching. Yeah. So when I think about grow for like my bigger kids, mm-hmm. I, I definitely think that there's a little bit of apologetics in there, right? Mm-hmm. Like they, they have big questions about why we do things the way we do or why yeah. 
why we don't do things the way some other people do. Um, and so some of their their growth, especially in that phase, has to do with them really coming to a deeper understanding yeah. um, of, of how we arrived at this or or what this means for us living it out because it's so nuanced. Right. Right. Like that's one of the church's favorite things is like both and. So yes. sometimes to nuance the both and can take a little bit of time. So a that, lot of time. Yeah. So that for me, I think is where we're kind of living and grow with some of the bigger kids. Now the littler right. kids, they're still growing, like you said, yeah. in this really Jesus centered way. Yes. But but the, the the deeper you go in, the more yeah. you start to learn about our faith, the more you're going to have those questions. But if we can instill in them that connection with being Christ-centered in all things, mm-hmm. I think that's the foundation that then we can go back to even in these deeper things. Absolutely. Right. So nothing that we do is contrary to what Christ wants for us or has done for us. And so having that foundation there. Um, and then the third thing for growth is prayer, right? Always prayer. Yes. Amen. Always prayer. Everything rooted in prayer. It's just, as St. Therese says, it's a surge of the heart toward God. And just yes. like with worship, just there's all different kinds of ways to pray, 100%, right? 100%, yeah. yeah. Though I will I will say this, and this is something that's been on my heart <laughs> recently, like I'm always the pray on your feet, right? You and I have talked about this. I'm going to pray in the moment. Jesus and I have all kinds of conversations all day. But I think that there is a beauty in being able to set aside a specific time. Yeah. And I, I've been doing that more and I see a change in my own life from that. I think there's um, value in the discipline of prayer. Yes. And I think that can be challenging for us, especially yeah. as we get older and we're running around a lot yeah. and praying on your feet is absolutely like the key to survival. Right. No joke. Right. But yes, the discipline of taking time to pray is so important. Whatever that prayer is, whether yes. it is music, whether it is a devotion, whether it is mm-hmm. scripture study, but taking that half hour yes, and committing it. And saying like, this is the only thing I'm yes. doing right now and this is important. And not checking your phone for all the dings that are going right. off while you're praying. Yeah, definitely. And this is something the Lord has put on my heart too because it's not in my nature is obedience. Hmm. That part of growing with him and growing in him is obedience to what he is asking of us because he's asking of us in love Amen. and for our growth and for our relationship with him. And so just to be in prayer with him, right? Yeah. 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 Oh. So our last uh, little stop here on this spinny wheel thing that we're doing here <laughs> in the Detroit model of evangelization. Oh, see, now I'm just thinking of that, that go the spinny round thing in the playground. What oh, is yes. that called? Not oh, the merry go round, but about. the thing that makes you throw up. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I'm thinking. I, that is I, not I, what this is. I think they took all those out of playgrounds. Oh, no. We came across a few. Yeah. yeah. Well, not in ours, oh, okay. but in some other parks we've been to. So the last, the last, <laughs> last stop <laughs> here is is to witness, which just yes. makes total sense, right? Like we, yeah. we saw something we liked. We've encountered Jesus Christ in power. We've grown mm-hmm. in our relationship with him and our understanding of our faith and we're sent forth to be joyful missionary disciples to witness the love of jesus to other people out in the world 100 percent. if you can tell me about the latest youtube video that you have watched ad nauseum for like two hours you better be able to tell me about jesus amen. too, right <laughs> amen and i think the yeah. the easiest i wouldn't say the easiest but i think no. the most notable um way this happens even like totally unconsciously like mm-hmm. we don't even realize we're doing it is the way we live in the Absolutely. real world like we just we're just different yeah. and we've talked about being countercultural on many episodes what? since then probably like all 42 what? of the ones before this we've mentioned <laughs> that word but but, but people notice that about you right yes. and in your witness yeah. you attract more people right? right the cycle continues even if it's just morbid curiosity like yes. why are you the way that you are absolutely right? but then hopefully that curiosity leads them into an encounter with the living Christ yes yeah so like resisting gossip taming our tongues um, and especially with the kids I think this is one that I talk to my kids about a lot like you can be there to listen to your friends without getting embroiled in the drama mm. right yeah. Yeah, I think um, I was just talking to some uh, youth ministers a couple weeks ago at a conference, and then I'm talking to some middle schoolers later today, actually, about this. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the terms that I came across in getting ready to talk about their dignity was the idea of false dignity Mm. and that, you know, we're all made for a relationship, right? Like, that's scriptural. Right. Um, We were all made for a relationship. We were all made for love, and we want authentic 
community with other people. And sometimes we we fall into the temptation of like, oh, but if I'm with my friends and we're gossiping about someone else, I, like that kind of feeds temporarily that desire to be in relationship with someone. Oh, absolutely. But it's but it's not real. It's a right? false belonging. Your your it's, belonging isn't based on who you are or who the no, other person it's is. It's based at the expense of somebody else. Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. Absolutely. Um, I think the other thing that I work with my children on is to be able to do Catholic things without embarrassment. So bless yourselves at different times. Pray before meals, no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. Um, Those are more like outwardly prayerful things. Yeah. But I think sometimes kids get embarrassed to do them when no one else is. Yeah. But But if you're setting that example from the beginning, it's really helpful. Like it's just just what we do. This is what we do. It's just what we do. Yes. And then we talked about this already. Just be joyful, Mm -hmm. right? Make people feel seen and known and loved. So bringing it full circle, everybody wants that. Amen. Everybody wants to belong. You know, Mother Teresa would say that loneliness is is our biggest, is is the biggest um, battle right now. Like the biggest sickness is our loneliness. And we know that coming out of the pandemic that all these studies have shown. So if we as church can help people, if our kids as young disciples can help their friends feel seen and known and loved, what a tremendous impact that would be with these kids who are struggling with anxiety, who are struggling with depression, who are struggling with confusion about who they are and what it means to be loved and to love one another. If we can help our kids to be models of what Christ is and who Christ is, what a tremendous impact we could have in our schools and in our world. Amen. And that (laughs) is part of our challenge, I think, for this coming week, is to come together as family and think about what are the gifts that God's given you and how can you use them to be serving him, to be missionary disciples out in the world today, um, knowing knowing fully mm-hmm. what Christ has given your family, how can you be sharing him with others? And maybe as parents, you guys can be writing some little notes to your kids, sharing with them the gifts that you see in them, what you appreciate about them and encouraging them to share their faith. So you're saying not just like nagging them about the things I'd like them to grow in. Yeah, no post-it note that just says like, <laughs> pick up your socks, right? Why are they always on the floor? It's always, <laughs> it's the, always socks. the socks. Yeah, yeah. It's so, always the sock. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Well, never socks. two, just the one. <laughs> or it's two different socks. Right. So maybe more like a, I really love the way that you stick up for your friends. Yes. You have a beautiful voice when you sing at church. Yeah. I, I love the way you are not afraid to pray with people who need it. I love mm-hmm. the way you're always willing to lend a helping hand to someone who Absolutely. is feeling discouraged, right? Like there's just so yeah. many beautiful ways I that you can do that. I love that you acknowledge the homeless every time yes. we pass by. Amen. 100%. <laughs> Well, thank you for listening to Beyond Sunday. We hope this week brings many opportunities for you to appreciate how God is working in and through your children and your whole family. Find more episodes at 52sundays.com slash podcast or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget, you can reach us at beyondsunday at aod.org. This episode of Beyond Sunday has been brought to you by Assumption University in Windsor, Ontario one of Canada's most historic Catholic institutes of higher learning, tracing its origins to 1857. Learn more about their online graduate diploma in Catholic studies by going to assumptionu.ca or follow them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram.